Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and welcome to the 2021 Besterman Lecture. It's a great pleasure to have you here at Magdalen. Um, 2021 is a very important year for the Voltaire Foundation. It's our 50th anniversary. It's 50 years since Theodore Besterman founded the foundation, and 45 years since the foundation came to Oxford. And it's an important year also because it's a transitional year. Um, we've just come to the end. We are coming to the end. What's been one of the major projects of the last 50 years, which is to produce the definitive print edition of Voltaire. And as that comes to an end, we're opening up lots of new projects, expanding our work in, in digital enlightenment studies, and also repositioning ourselves and rethinking ourselves as, as an enlightenment centre in Oxford, and thinking about what an enlightenment centre in Oxford ought to be. And in that connection, um, the title of, of Sophie Rosenfeld's lecture, How the Enlightenment Understood Truth, why that matters. Well, <laughs> that's not just a great title for a lecture. It's a great, um, it's a great manifesto for an Enlightenment Centre. So we couldn't have a, a better title or a better lecture to, to celebrate this year in 2021. We're, when we first talked to you about this lecture a year or so ago, Arvi and I, um, we exchanged emails and said we, you said you didn't want to give this lecture online. You would come in person, and we've done it. So thank you very much. <laughs> and I now give the hand over to my colleague Greg Brown, who will introduce Sophie Rosenfeld. Thank you so much. Good evening. I'm Gregory Brown. I'm a professor of history at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and a senior research fellow here at uh, the Voltaire Foundation. Um, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Sophie Rosenfeld. Sophie Rosenfeld is the Walter Annenberg Professor of History at the University of Pennsylvania, where she teaches European intellectual and cultural history with a special emphasis on the Enlightenment, Atlantic Revolutions, and the legacy of the 18th century for modern democracy. She received her BA from Princeton University and her PhD from Harvard. She's been professor of history at Yale and the University of Virginia, and held fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, the American Council of Learned Societies, and a visiting professorship at the Ecole des Études en Sciences Sociales. She's also uh, was served as the co-editor of the journal Modern Intellectual History and has just completed a term as the Vice President for Research of the American Historical Association. Her scholarly work over the past 20 years or more has been framed by an ongoing interest in the history of ideas in the context of emotions, beliefs, and modes of expression. And she's, within that vein, um, produced a number of innovative works on the history of free speech, dissent, and censorship, on the history of political theory, and particularly feminist theory, on epistemology, and on the history of information and misinformation. She's published articles on these topics in the leading scholarly journals of our field, the American Historical Review, the Journal of Modern History, French Historical Studies, the William and Mary Quarterly. And she's also made contributions to important Journals of Opinion, New York Times, Washington Post, Dissent, and The Nation. She's currently writing a book on the concept of personal choice and how it became central to conceptions of freedom in the modern world. Her previous books are noteworthy. Uh, she published in 2001, A Revolution in Language, The Problem of Signs in Late 18th Century France, and then Common Sense of Political History with Harvard Press in 2011, which won a number of prizes in both European and American history. Uh, her most recent book, Democracy and Truth, a short history, published by Penn Press in 2019, uh, is the basis on which she's going to elaborate in tonight's talk, which is entitled How the Enlightenment Understood Truth and Why That Matters. So please join me in welcoming Sophia Rosenberg. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Greg, and um, thank you very much to the Voltaire Foundation for this invitation, and it's really an honor to be here this evening in this beautiful setting, and it's an honor to be here in a live setting. I'm delighted. Thank you for being an audience in a, in a, in a, real, a real room with real people is now something of a treat, so I'm really very pleased to be here. Thank you. All right. Let me just also thank very directly Avi Lipschitz for this invitation and Nicholas Krent as well. Okay. Is this mic working? 
Yes. Okay. Just, just, just being sure. Actually, maybe I can do this without glasses too. It's a common place these days to say that truth is in trouble. It was already five years ago in 2016, as you undoubtedly know, just after the initial vote on Brexit, just before the election of Donald Trump, what the Oxford Dictionary's named post-truth the word of the year. The term surged in popularity on both sides of the Atlantic in the mid-2010s as a way to signal the wave of misinformation and disinformation that seemed to be washing over all of us from elected officials to social media feeds where we'd all become pundits, publishers, and distributors, as well as consumers. But even more, post-truth was used as shorthand for the sense that any common ground about where and how to find the truth and who had access to it had disappeared. And what's more, a large number of people, it was suggested, just didn't care anymore. On the contrary, they'd embraced a kind of blurry approach to the lines between truth and falsehood on the one hand and knowledge and belief on the other. Some seemed to value personal authenticity, some sort of notion of tell it like it is, or conformity with pre-existing sentiment rather than veracity or accuracy. And some seem to want to win at all costs, truth be damned. And an increasing number of people, and nowadays you might say more heavily on the right, but if we look back in, say, the 1960s, we'd probably say more heavily on the left, had come to see everything that establishment culture touts as a fact as actually a matter of opinion or spin, rejecting in some cases the idea that there are any impartial disinterested sources or methods or arbiters of truth out there, or any pure objective information at all. And I think the, the expression, my truth, is sort of emblematic of this. The result, commentators on post-truth suggested, was nothing less than an existential crisis for democracy. And now, in late 2021, some of us might say the situation actually looks even worse. When we can point to a host of additional factors to be worried about. The emergence of ever more convincing forms of dissimulation, like deep fakes, in which video and audio can effectively show people saying and doing things they've never said and done. Growing awareness of the number of governments around the world, now well beyond Russia, that are using similar forms of disinformation as weapons of domestic or international warfare, and sometimes aided by for-profit firms like Cambridge Analytica in the UK, or the Archimedes Group in Israel. Then there's decreasing trust in institutions, especially those associated with verifiable vetted knowledge. Before it was mainly the press, but now that's probably extended to universities, schools, governmental and independent research bodies around the world. And finally, if we're just cataloging a sort of depressing series of <laughs> developments here, more evidence of the social and political harm stemming from viral untruths and conspiracy theories, from a rash of murders of perceived child abductors in India to the propping up of anti-migrant and anti-immigrant uh, sentiment in Europe, to most recently, and maybe most obviously, the rejection of public health measures such as COVID-19 vaccinations around the globe. And now, for those of you who follow US politics, the so-called big lie, the baseless yet enduring claim that the last presidential election was stolen from the man who would have won if there hadn't been massive cheating, threatens not only to undermine future elections, and I think that's especially the case if policy is made on the, to counter effectively disinformation, which seems to be happening, but it also promises to foster lasting popular distrust in official information that could make a post-election democracy ungovernable and indeed undesirable. And this model too is already gaining followers around the world. There are copycat versions. This week's news about Brazil has sort of similar campaigns to say that elections are rigged even before they've happened. Okay, so now I apologize for that very depressing beginning. Um, but it's this widely sense, shared sense of a crisis that leads us, I think, to pose a classic historical question. How did we get to this point? And more directly, how did the marriage of truth and democracy, which looks pretty good on the surface at least, go so astray? <laughs> 
But the historian in me insists that to think effectively about being post anything requires seeing more about the pre or the norm from which the present marks a deviation and its own vicissitudes. And this is also the kind of historical question that particularly interests me. And that's because it requires us to think about the kind of taken for granted and seemingly ahistorical assumptions as opposed to the more prominent kinds of contentious issues that historians are more likely to study. But to think about how these assumptions provide a grounding on which modern politics rests. And the nature and value of truth in the context of democracy is one of those assumptions, something I think we rarely stop to think about or even notice until it's under threat, but which it's vital to uncover if we really want to understand the ground on which we stand right now. And if we look closely, I think what we'll see, though many commentators have not, is that the full story doesn't actually start in 2016 with Brexit or the election of Trump or the coronation of the neologism post-truth. Nor does it start in 2005 with the advent of Facebook and YouTube and Twitter, one right after the other, or even in the last decades of the 20th century with the deregulation of broadcast media, the consolidation of media ownership, and the rise of 24-hour news entertainment in much of the world, though obviously those developments are all important to the last phases of the story, and I'm more than happy to say any more about them afterward if anyone is interested. But I also think it's important not to take the cynic's point of view, which is that there's never anything new under the sun, that politics has always been thus. Rather, I want to suggest, and here I am indeed building on my 2019 book, Truth and Democracy, that the full story starts in the very particular truth regime in which modern democracy was initially founded. And I'm using that slightly jargony phrase, truth regime, which I borrow from Foucault, deliberately to suggest that truth has, in fact, been looked for, understood, even celebrated in different ways in different times and places. And the job of the historian of political ideas, every bit as much as the job of the historian of science, is to recover those shifts. And in this case, the truth regime corresponds to the late stages of the transatlantic enlightenment. And so now I'd like to really begin this late afternoon, if that's what we can call 5.30, with a deep dive back into that moment some 250 years ago, just before twin political revolutions rocked the two sides of the Atlantic, British, North America, and France, and before we work our way forward towards the present and what I would call our current predicament. For what I'd like to propose is that the knowledge crisis of today cannot really be understood apart from both the promise and perils of the view of truth and its operation that got baked into this distinctive and ultimately peculiar form of political life that we now call democracy in the moment of its modern reimagination. So, the Enlightenment. Now, there's probably a fair amount of danger in generalizing about the Enlightenment in front of this particular crowd. Um, but if you'll indulge me for a moment to do so, <laughs> I want to suggest that Kassira was right to a good extent. The overwhelming preoccupation around which the Enlightenment took form across a disparate geography and a variety of other differences was a question about knowledge itself. How can humans collectively eradicate error and myth and false belief and obfuscation which seem to permeate thinking on topics ranging from sexual difference to rulership, and get closer to having an accurate picture of what the world is really like. Many, well, still celebrated responses, of course, focused on methods for knowing things, or what we might now call epistemology. From Hume to Condillac to Kant, the Enlightenment was rife with efforts to outline and promote an esprit philosophique or approach to knowledge that could be applied well beyond the natural sciences and even across various cultures and civilizations. Many leading 18th century intellectuals, or intellects we might call them, for example, promoted a method that relied on grounding all claims in lived sense experience or empiricism, but started with a taste for questioning platitudes and ended with applying critical reason to the evidence. It was a combination that led in certain ways towards epistemological modesty, 
but in others towards epistemological utopianism, or maybe even arrogance, imagining limitless horizons for knowledge and bettering the human condition, and all of history is the story of the expansion of the human mind. That's a topic unto itself. But importantly, and this is really the point here, not all responses focused exclusively on the inner workings of our mental equipment. Others drew attention to the larger social and political conditions under which truth about the world could potentially best come to light and flourish. Specifically, in the second half of the 18th century, a small number of critics of monarchical government on both sides of the Atlantic, and you can think of Jean-Jacques Rousseau on one side and maybe Tom Paine on the other, developed a novel argument. They claimed that one major comparative advantage of states where power rested primarily in the people, and in a few cases in actual republics, which is of course the term that's used, not democracy in the 18th century, when democracy really only emerges as a term when it loses its pejorative connotations in the 19th century. But the distinctive aspect for them of republics in particular was that they would have a uniquely close connection to truth. Whereas kings, like priests and indeed aristocrats too, had traditionally relied on secrecy and cunning and, de and deception as regular, even valuable tools of rulership, you might think of Versailles, in the era of Louis XIV, you should, republics would thrive on precisely the opposite set of values. Those were transparency, so everything would be visible to the naked eye, a taste for concrete evidence and demonstrability, and a commitment to personal sincerity and candor. The writer Louis Sébastien Mercier, a Rousseau fan, imagined circa 1771 that the world of the distant future he put it in 2,440, though technically something of a hybrid between a monarchy and a republic would become, quote, a book of morals, meaning everything and everyone would be fully legible to everyone else. We might call this now an open book or something like that. And lying, he said, would have become a crime. Moreover, in the case of truth and democratic forms of governance, the promise by the end of the century is that one would become an instrument of the other. Citizens in a heterogeneous society would neither need nor be able to agree on everything, especially religious teachings. But certain truths, meaning basic moral and factual ones, would serve as the starting point for public deliberation. And then participation in the political process from discussion to debate to maybe voting in some cases too, would in the end aid the cause of truth's discovery and expression. It was an idea that I think was appealing to members of a burgeoning capitalist marketplace as well as devotees of enlightenment ideals. Republics would ultimately make the dream of the coincidence of virtue and knowledge or truth seeking and truth telling in both a moral and an epistemic sense a reality. And you can find examples of this conviction everywhere, especially in the late 1790s. So the Marquis de Condorcet is writing in prison at the height of the terror in 1794. He's still convinced that, quote, zeal for the truth, unquote, was the driving force behind the inevitable transformations of the present. And at almost the same time, in the middle of the debates over the Alien and Sedition Acts in the new United States, James Madison was similarly saying, and it is an unassailable fact that, quote, in a republic, light will prevail over darkness, truth over error, unquote. And I venture to suggest that to a certain extent, many of us still agree, which may be why we still see a crisis for truth as a crisis for democracy. But, and I think there's kind of bound to be a but to this story, here's where the picture gets complicated. Consider the strategic use of we in we hold these truths to be self-evident, as laid out in the Declaration of Independence in the summer of 1776, just as plans for the world's first large-scale republic were getting off the ground. For 18th century thinkers, what would distinguish all truths in the public sphere under the conditions of popular sovereignty, and that is truths apart from logical ones, I'm not really talking about two plus two equals four here. What would distinguish all other kinds of truths is first that they would be collective, communal conclusions. 
They'd be social products dependent on multiple sources of evidence and exchange, much like Kant's imagined Republic of Letters or even Diderot's Encyclopédie, simply on a larger scale. No one person or institution or even sector, that means no king, no priest or national research body or specific caste would alone get to determine what's what. So that's the first point. The second is, moreover, no one set of truths, and here again I mean primarily factual and to a slightly lesser degree moral truths, not logical ones, would ever be definitive or fixed or treated as dogma either. In everyday life in a republic, collective truths of all kinds had to be provisional, allowing for the possibility of correction of course as new evidence came to light. Ideally, something like what scholars today call public knowledge would be worked out through a permanently open-ended back and forth among different kinds of peoples. A small number would play specialized leadership roles, inside or outside government, as a result of their specialized knowledge. That's a role that many of the philosophes initially imagined for themselves. The majority, though certainly never everyone, would operate with whatever kind of everyday experiential wisdom they had as simply citizens living in the world. And jointly, listening to each other, and with the help of various media as brokers, they would, ideally, come to some kind of basic but loose consensus about what causes what, what's broadly desirable, what's dangerous, and how to categorize what's already happened. At least that's how key thinkers in the history of democracy, from Condorcet in the, up to John Dewey, and really all the way to John Rawls in the latter part of the 20th century, have envisioned it. Jefferson famously noted in the early days of the United States that a politics dedicated to the common good required, quote, the diffusion of knowledge into the hands of the people's common sense, unquote. Nearly 200 years later, John Rawls, a great theorist of liberal democracy, was still saying something that sounds surprisingly similar to me about working out the principles of justice. He said, quote, we must rely upon common knowledge as recognized by common sense and the existing scientific consensus, unquote. And how was that supposed to happen in the first republics formed in the age of revolution? It seems in retrospect, almost mystically, following nothing more than a few basic principles all established at the beginning. One was trust in other people's basic honesty. It had to be assumed that most of the time, most people meant what they said. A second was plain speech, a style of unadorned public communication that suggested sincerity on the part of speakers but also fostered cooperation and understanding across class, ideological, regional, and educational divides. You could think here of the blunt language, for instance, of the sans-culotte, or of Ben Franklin and his poor Richard guys, rather than the ornate, euphemistic language of aristocrats in court. And finally, there was free speech, which was the only one of these governing principles to be enshrined in formal law. Here the idea, dating all the way back to John Milton, but certainly espoused as well by Voltaire, was that competition in information, claims, publications, would, in a world in which it was hard to be certain about much, ultimately work to gradually dispel errors in fact and in interpretation alike, especially those born of religious orthodoxy. Yet what this is all meant, if we turn now from political rhetoric or theory, which is what I've been talking about, to actually political practice, is that most kinds of truth under the conditions that we now call democracy have never actually been self-evident at all. Rather, they've always, from the 18th century onwards, been something to fight over in terms of what counts as truth and even more, who ultimately makes that decision and on what grounds. Lacking in precise content or means of arbitration, truth as envisioned during the Enlightenment has always been precarious, something that needs to be repeatedly won. And what's more, and this is really my key point, the democratic truth process has been threatened continually ever since its modern refounding by those who've tried hard to hijack it which is to say to kind of hustle it out of this 
agonistic but ultimately cooperative, collaborative public sphere and capture the power that comes from having the exclusive right to define it. On the one hand, the threat has sometimes come from, no from knowledge elites, experts we now call them, using 19th century parlance. People who can claim superior access to truth and trustworthiness on account of their breeding and later specialized training, which of course also traditionally implies something about their race and gender and relative wealth. That's especially the case when those experts have insisted upon the validity of their knowledge in isolation without the leavening effect of ordinary people's basic, more experiential sense of the world. But on the other hand, the threat has also at times come from those claiming to speak for ordinary or regular or real people. That is, people thought, whether by themselves or by others, to possess a kind of quotidian knowledge of how the world works born of simply living in it, particularly when they have insisted successfully on popular consensus alone without the corrective of expert trained perspectives or outlying voices of any kind. And ironically, while both elite knowledge born of erudition and specialized methods and the experiential wisdom of the crowd can lead not just either of those alone, can lead not just to flawed claims and bad policies, either can spur the dismantling of democratic politics altogether. So I really want to emphasize here that working together is the sort of ideal here, but the pulling of one of these strands simply apart from the other has potentially catastrophic consequences. And ironically, it was Robespierre who did so much to forge both what counts as modern democracy but also the modern police state who saw the risk from both sides already in the 1790s. Democracy perishes, he says, by two excesses. The aristocracy of those who govern, we might call that the tyranny of the ruling class, or the contempt of the people for the authorities which it has itself established, a contempt in which each faction or individual reaches out for the public power and reduces the people through the resulting chaos to nullity or the power of a single man, unquote, which we might call populist authoritarianism. Champions of liberal democracy, or representative democracy as a whole, have been trying to ward off both tendencies in their extreme form as real and oddly parallel risks ever since. In my remaining time then, I'd like to say something about how this conflict emerged, again drawing primarily on its point of origins in the transatlantic enlightenment, and that set the terms for much of what I think we're still living with. And then finally, in a less historical vein, but linked to this analysis of the past, if you'll indulge me, I'm gonna say a few words about what makes this current moment different, what we might do about it, and ultimately why it matters to think about the 18th century in the 21st. So let me start with the expertise part of the story. I'll do sort of one, then the other. And the expertise part of the story, which has long posed a kind of threat to democracy when it's gained too much the upper hand. The story goes back a long ways. As everybody in this room knows, by the late 17th into the 18th century, European rulers already found themselves requiring a growing number of advisors map makers, explorers, financial wizards, historians, military specialists, trade experts, and more, both inside government and outside, and sometimes in the case of Voltaire, playing kind of double roles. The growth of a knowledge bureaucracy from academies to census bureaus is a vital part of the story of the expansion of the modern state. It also brought into being a new class of persons associated with the truth-related needs of society and the state. And here we can think of the growing category of useful knowledge. And even in the earliest modern republics, those formed in the US and in France in the late 18th century, so deliberately in contrast to the monarchical states they left behind, it was widely understood that in order to put state-of-the-art knowledge to work, leadership roles had to be assumed by the most virtuous, often called men of their word, and the most wise, or men of knowledge. Indeed, rather than end with the age of revolutions and new claims of popular rule and equality before the law, the impulse only intensified. 
It was once revolutionaries turned their attention to putting these nascent republics on stable post-revolutionary foundations that real efforts began on both sides of the Atlantic to build an aristocracy of talent or a natural aristocracy in the words of both Madame de Staal and Jefferson. From this vantage point, we cannot be surprised that the members of the Federalist faction behind the new constitution that came into being in the US in the late 1780s insisted on leadership drawn from, quote, men of, with special obligations to wisdom and integrity, unquote. And that's the words of the Philadelphian Benjamin Rush, who also long and unsuccessfully advocated for a special elite national university for training men specifically for the demands of public leadership. He didn't get his way, but the Federals did prevail in making the case for real financial requirements for eligibility to vote and to hold office, as well as indirect forms of voting when it came to various forms of elections. The Electoral College in the United States is really a holdover from this era. And this was all so that, in the words of yet another Federalist, Roger Sherman, quote, the people should have as little to do as may be about government, unquote, even as they were sovereign. And if you think this is a particularly American twist, it's worth pointing out that the same kind of logic governed the pol Parisian political establishment just after the terror. A core group of Thermidorian and then directorial leaders worked hard in the mid to late 1790s, not just to establish new institutions for the training of this new kind of national elite. The Ecole Normale, for instance, are, were established to train teachers in methods for educating the public in how to arrive at the proper kind of knowledge. But this group of political leaders also, through censorship efforts and new restrictions on the franchise, aimed to concentrate powers in the hands of the well-off, the educated, and the Republican-minded, and to curtail this say of their political enemies, including the lower classes. And ironically, just as nation states in North America, Latin America, and much of Europe were actually democratizing in the 19th century in the sense of eliminating chattel slavery, extending educational opportunities, and trying out universal manhood suffrage in what many saw as a kind of second wave of this 18th century revolutionary tradition, so did a new kind of knowledge professional appear on the scene. Both on public and pi private payrolls, men, and I'm using that word deliberately here, who now call themselves not just experts, but now specialists and scientists and professionals, all new coinages of the 19th century, proved themselves more useful than ever as governments expanded their purview, in part to compensate for the problems generated by expanding democratization and capitalism, and needed more information, especially of a quantifiable sort, to build government surface, services upon. And these were just the precursors, it now appears, to the policy experts like economists and urban planners who would dominate late 19th and then 20th century statecraft, both domestically everywhere from Japan to Mexico and in colonial and eventually post-colonial states as well. And here we can probably refer, many of you may already be thinking of Max Weber's famous arguments to the effect that democracy and bureaucracy were born together, but the latter would always prove to be a thorn in the side of the former because they pulled in opposite directions and not least in terms of their social foundations. And indeed, much of the 20th century seems rife with examples of states that have done just that, increasingly moved towards technocracy, which is one name for the modern planning state that seems to be run almost entirely by bureaucrats and specialists. The most common example today is actually generally given as the European Union. And I won't say more about that now, but certainly something we could talk about. But what I'm trying to say with these examples is that one real danger of the trajectory of modern political life is that under the banner of expanding democracy, we've steadily pushed all truth but technocratic truth to the side. The result, not just the reinforcement of a kind of intellectual disrespect for ordinary people as ignorant and credulous and emotionally volatile that can also be traced all the way back to Voltaire, but ultimately the undermining of democracy itself as reality is defined in ways that seem alien or even false to many people's experience. This is though, as anyone who knows their 18th century history is aware, only half the story at best. For resistance to elites dominance of knowledge production and elite ways of knowing 
also began before the age of revolutions. So I think both sides of the story really have important Enlightenment foundations. Consider again my current hometown, Philadelphia, with its early Quaker investment in simplicity and practical know-how. Or consider the claims of the English dissenter, John Burke, who insisted that there was little reason to believe, quote, the brain of a statesman was made of materials different from that of a citizen, unquote. On both sides of the Atlantic, such commitments provided the seeds for an 18th century backlash against more traditional forms of intellectual pretension. And even more, they provided ammunition for the idea that some truths could also, or maybe even better, be found through alternative means, including faith, but also instinct and common sense, the kind of practical wisdom of the kitchen table. It was an idea that would assume an Enlightenment pedigree every bit as much as a more highfalutin appeal to critical reason and virtue. Effective challenges to established and elite truths sometimes required nothing more, it was claimed, than le bon sens du village, a kind of ordinary person's reasonableness. And it might be said that in 1776, Tom Paine gave this alternative epistemology for the first time political significance, suggesting that when it came to the truths of politics, ordinary people not only knew enough, but actually in the aggregate, knew better. Calling on a kind of reverse snobbery, he suggested it was precisely the people's native honesty and plain understanding of things that allowed them to cut through all the phony truisms and absurdities traditionally spouted by church and king and their fancy overeducated spokespeople, like the absurd idea that a continent should be ruled by an island, and to get back, therefore, to basic truths. Moreover, he insisted the everyday logic of common sense provided a foundation on which an entirely new kind of government could be built. And until they were put out of business by their Federalist opponents, Paine's radical friends and contemporaries, including briefly the Dr. Benjamin Rush, before he changed his mind, worked to forge a first state constitution for Pennsylvania that temporarily kind of tried to turn this into something like a reality, a transparent democracy, fully open to regular input from ordinary citizens and without an epistemic ruling class. A little more than 15 years later, the French authors of the Jacobin Constitution of 1793 temporarily attempted, but was never put into practice, the same thing, collapsing entirely the difference between active and passive citizenship and proposing for the first time a common education system for the nation. And ever since, at its best, the repudiation of elite epistemology and the defense of the honesty, but also the particular kind of wisdom characterized by characteristic of ordinary people, meaning those outside the realm of educated expertise, which therefore a category that at various moments could include women, it could include people of color, peasants, workers of both sexes, has, come, has served as a way to justify a wide variety of emancipatory social and political movements directed at giving voice to those traditionally denied one. That includes the early labor movement, abolitionist and later civil rights movements, and women's rights movements. The common denominator, in addition to the more obvious thing we usually discuss, which is claims about rights, has been the promise of a different and possibly even superior truth derived from different social and epistemic foundations. Yet this hasn't been the only or even dominant form that the challenge to elite or established truth has taken over the last 200 plus years in France, in the US, or anywhere else. For once, even quasi-democratic governments have been established, non-expert, non-elite claims to truth have often worked quite the opposite way. And you'll see we're getting to the present in a moment here. Not to make a claim on behalf of those marginalized by the dominant conception of truth, but instead as a way to try to reinforce the idea of a single truth position on the part of an ill-defined but exclusionary entity like the real people or even the true people. For just as claims of elite knowledge without the corrective of popular truth can turn exclusionary and lead to a kind of sterile technocratic government that you could associate with Washington or Brussels, so arguments for the people as the primary source of truth in a democracy can run a parallel risk. That's an encouraging disdain for all forms of verifiable expert knowledge and its purveyors. 
probably some of you remember the famous comment of Michael Gove pre-Brexit, I think the people have had enough of experts. This has become something of a classic, as well as a kind of disdain for dissenting voices of all kinds. And what I'm describing is, of course, a recognizable style of politics traditionally available on the right or on the left, from high or from on high or from below, that today often gets labeled populism. That term doesn't exist in the 18th century, but it's a term that we use for this. And populism is notoriously difficult to define. But what I want to propose is that populism depends at its core on a narrative of a very particular and long-standing kind of conspiracy tale related to the source and status of truth in the context of self-rule. The starting point is that some group of people, often intellectual elites, with or without being in cahoots with an oppressed or marginal group like immigrants or a religious or ethnic minority, this combination has, with obfuscating jargon and phony claims learned at school, usurped the people's basic primordial democratic right to define the way the world is. But, this narrative goes, when the real or the true people finally wake up and realize that everything around them, from government intelligence to the press to the conclusions of universities and scientific organizations is subterfuge, or in today's terms, fake news, they will be able to restore the reign of the true people's everyday common sense and candor. And then the reign of real life consensual and ultimately post-political solutions to real life problems will begin at last. And this storyline too, as it sets the terms for conspiracy theory, has 18th century roots right along with this idea of a politics rooted in le bon sens du village. You can find the main elements right alongside those other kinds of claims in the writings of radical, radical Jacobins and American anti-federalists. But even more, you find it in European counter-revolutionaries of all stripes, including even Edmund Burke. For they all complained in their very different ways about philosophically-minded elites with their lofty abstractions like rights talk, pulling the wool over the eyes of regular people in a kind of intellectual sleight of hand. And they all insisted in turn in a trend that would only grow in the 19th and 20th centuries, that the people in the singular, with their quotidian experience, basic know-how, and ordinary everyday language, had the tools necessary to see through all the deception and ultimately to know and to do better. The tale morphs in its particulars across time, but the same basic storyline keeps cropping up repeatedly if sporadically since the 18th century from fringe party platforms to presidential rhetoric, stoked by a commercial press and government propaganda, emerging, again, from on high and from on low simultaneously. And whereas technocratic truth, now often associated commonly with neoliberalism, seemed to be ascendant globally at the turn of this century, a populist approach to truth and knowledge including attacks on both educated elite notions of facticity and the ethical imperative of truth-telling, seems in response to have become the fastest growing, if not necessarily yet the most dominant idiom of politics in the world today, and with a lot of attendant risk. If this trend continues, one possibility is deadlock or dysfunction or even some kind of anarchy as truth becomes entirely a matter of right, a battle between warring epistemic camps unwilling to compromise. The other, as Robespierre foresaw, is the rise of a charismatic leader who preys on popular resentment and fear, as well as susceptibility to flattery around the idea of the people's common sense, and turns into something of a demagogue, especially when it comes to determinations of truth. Which brings us back now squarely to this moment. If we accept and you may and you may not, but I'm going to propose this idea. If we accept that technocratic and populist conceptions of truth have long been on a collision course, and that this much is really built into the structure of post-enlightenment democracy, but that their antagonism and indeed desire to eliminate the other has recently been ramped up by a new set of factors ranging from new technology to growing inequality, the obvious next question is, what, if anything, can be done? One answer, probably the dominant one from academic quarters like this, 
is to try to find ways to bolster what I would call Enlightenment epistemic values. Commonly proposed solutions range from shoring up nonpartisan fact checking, even if much of the time it backfires by actually bringing to attention things that it means to discredit, to supporting institutions with clear pedagogical missions rooted in Enlightenment logic. Schools, libraries, museums, research institutes like this one, all can be encouraged both to teach a healthy, healthy, properly democratic skepticism towards all official truth, but also some sense of how and where verifiable knowledge is produced, where it can be found, and of what demonstrability and proof consist. And such institutions can be encouraged to look for new ways to bring into contact traditional knowledge elites and ordinary people of all ages and backgrounds expanding at least in a sociological way the production of knowledge in the spirit of fostering what Kant called once wistfully an enlightened age. That's what we know best probably how to do. And moreover, I think we probably would all agree with our 18th century forefathers and foremothers that though some kinds of truth, those of medicine for example, can probably survive without liberal democracy, Liberal democracy can't easily continue to exist without any commitment to a common foundation in truth and hostility to lies as a moral position, as a starting point for effective debates, and as a key aspiration. For especially without an aspiration towards knowing more and better, and the conviction it's possible through a variety of intellectual work, there's little reason why we might want to live under such an uncertain and precarious system of government in the first place. But another harder possibility, and one which to me, alas, seems increasingly necessary since I finished writing Truth and Democracy almost three years ago, is to at least consider whether our existing and deeply rooted truth paradigms have become so ineffective as to finally, more than 200 years later, become obsolete. For one, most proposed solutions to the epistemic conditions of the present don't try to remedy or even broach the innate weaknesses of the Enlightenment conception of truth, which, of which we are really the sort of generally unselfconscious inheritors. That includes the ways in which we must live with a potentially destabilizing amount of mis- and disinformation as part of getting to truth without any guarantee that the latter will ever prevail and the ways intense partisan conflict over truth, and especially who gets to define it, are thus rendered in inevitable. It also includes the way we have to trust in trust and have few remedies when that trust is in short supply. But even more, none of these solutions really tackle the fact that all over the world, we've moved ever farther from the conditions of the transatlantic enlightenment that made this model dependent on its metaphors of self-regulating marketplaces, town hall meetings, and indeed the Republic of Letters, plausible in the first place, at least as an ideal, and that once helped mitigate those structural flaws. One factor is new technology, certainly, and associated private business and legal practices that have created speech conditions vastly different from those of the 18th or 19th centuries, maybe even the 20th. But that's not all. We also live in societies that are so much more culturally heterogeneous, but also in which wealth is so inequitably distributed and education and knowledge so specialized, all products of the simultaneous expansion of globalized capitalism along with democracy, that the identification of anything like a shared reality or even shared language across the whole range of citizenry now seems, to me at least, exceedingly difficult to imagine, if not impossible. The point is that unless we're prepared to make sweeping changes in our larger society, starting with a serious reformulation of our social and economic order in ways that might be both appealing and unappealing now, it may be time to reconsider the actual efficacy of the Enlightenment model of truth as the conceptual foundation for democracy today and start thinking of alternative possibilities. I'm genuinely not sure what that would look like. History offers no real blueprints beyond what came before in different circumstances. And historians certainly make better analysts of the past and maybe even the present than they do prognosticators. There's one thing I'm convinced of, however, 
understanding the loose combination of values and approaches to the world that we call the Enlightenment, both as the past and in terms of the ways it shaped our ideals for better and for worse since the age of revolutions is an essential starting point for any future democratic vision. For it's only in considering the disjunctures as well as the continuities and the gaps between metaphor and reality, then and now, that we will be able to discover where we can reasonably go next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is this mic? Yeah, this mm. mic's this mic is working. Um, well, my name is Avi Lipschitz. I work on 18th century European history here at Modlin College, Oxford, and I would like to thank Sophie Rosenfeld so much for this splendid talk full of so pregnant and fascinating insights. We really could not have had a more timely talk for the Besterman lecture this year. Um, I'm here mostly to moderate the discussion uh, because this is a quite large um, space. Uh, we have a roaming mic here and uh, my colleague Nicholas Kronk will try to enable you to um, pose your questions. So please just raise your hands and we'll try to um, bring the mic over to you. Um, and Sophie will kindly answer a few questions um, about this lecture. Um, yeah, Greg. Um, just Everybody's mic tonight. I know. All right, well, thank you so much for, for that talk. I guess I'm wondering if you have thoughts on how to integrate what you presented as a kind of clearly established Enlightenment idea about truth with the work of scholars who have actually called that into question. And, and, and I'm thinking, I mean, most prominently, um, and most evidently, I think probably most people here would be Isaiah Berlin, mm -hmm. for whom, you know, the essential argument was not about how do we get things right, it's how do we have plurality of truth. And this mm -hmm. was his, as it were, you know, critique of an interpretation of the Enlightenment. And I wonder if that is, in your mind, consistent with or just sort of aside from the narrative that you, that you laid out? Well, I mean, the, I think the important thing to recognize in all of this is that, there, first of all, there are two kinds of truth. There's what really is and there's what we say about it, right? And conceptions of the relationship between those two things have really varied over time. Today I went this afternoon, I took a lovely walk and went and looked at the ceiling of the Sheldonian Theater, which has, of course, an allegory of truth descending, right? It's very much a 17th century vision in which truth is a kind of singular thing that is coming down out of the sky and will, in a sense, illuminate itself for the world. By the 18th century, that doesn't really work as an idea, a single truth. And the beginnings of a kind of pluralism, I think, are already there in the 18th century. The assumption that no one person can hold the truth and then there's no one source for it. And in fact, it's only in this collective way. Not that there isn't anything real out there, but the closest we can get is to keep talking about it and debating it and trying to find it rather than grasping it, pulling it down. In the 20th century, we've gone mainly farther in that direction towards thinking of truth in this pluralistic way. Berlin is an interesting example there. However, we still wanted to hold on to some notion, most of us, I think even the most you know, postmodern thinkers still hold on to some notion of, the, of facticity, which is that certain things did happen or didn't, and there are certain things that are not a matter of point of view at all. And so we're grappling all the time, I think, with wanting to allow this large sphere for debate but also the fact that some things can be identified very clearly as misinformation or disinformation. How to put those two seemingly kind of irreconcilable positions together in a public sphere is in some ways the great problem of this moment. Well, I may 
abuse the um, yeah. chair's uh, privilege to uh, pose my own question because, I mean, we're still waiting for some others. And as you uh, said very uh, persuasively, we are the inheritors of a certain 18th century um, regime of truth. Um, are we also the inheritors of the 18th century self-awareness of the fragility of, of this um, uh, regime? Because as Antoine Lilti, for example, uh, showed in his recent book, I mean, the 18th century at its best, or the Enlightenment at its best, uh, is very much aware of its own self-contradictions. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. here of debates in the 60s and the 70s of the 18th century about, for example, um, enlightenment how far, enlightenment for whom, uh, you know, should we enlighten the simple folk? I mean, you refer to that uh, uh, quickly um, um, dur during the talk in the 1780s, even before the revolution in Germany, it is actually framed in those terms, wahre und falsche Aufklärung. Uh, so, in a way, wh where did we go wrong? Why didn't we yeah. acquire this sort of duality and ambiguity or self-criticism of this truth regime? That's a very interesting question, because you're right. I think that 18th century thinkers were on the whole quite aware that they were kind of working out a problem and they realized they wanted, even the Kant's formulation of we in an enlightened age or an age of enlightenment is this kind of, it was always about this sort of tension between these different ideas. I think in some ways they've become so naturalized for us that we don't often explore their parameters in full. And what I hope a discussion of these kinds of issues does is make us think again about why we think truth matters, why truth is related to democracy, kind of bringing back a self-consciousness to this topic. And that's really my, my larger goal. And so, for instance, I teach a course on the history of free speech. And when you teach a course on the history of freedom of expression of free speech in the United States, students who are not international students tend to have a very kind of knee-jerk defense of it as obviously the only good thing, and the more of it, the better. But as soon as you start actually working through problems like what do you do about misinformation? What do you do about hate? What do you do about sedition? What are all these kinds of, there's a kind of anxiety that emerges that says, well, maybe these ideas you know, are more complicated in some days and require more thinking through, especially in this current moment, than they have in the past, which is not an argument against free speech at all. It's simply an argument for a kind of self-consciousness that you're talking about. And that I think, you know, most, of the key Enlightenment thinkers were, as you say, acutely aware of. Michael Trolley. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for the, the lecture. My name is uh, Paul Tonks. I'm here as a visiting researcher at the Rothermere American Institute, mm -hmm. but normally based in uh, Seoul at Yonsei University. Um, I, I enjoyed your, your talk very much. I guess my, my question is, um, to some extent, about a kind of methodology and context and sort of similarities, differences, the local versus the international of sort of enlightenment singular versus enlightenment plural. Um, I guess if I think back in the, on the late um, 18th century and the interpretation um, from a, let's say, an American perspective, one thinks of, um, uh, and you talked about sort of times and you use some of the terminology like the regime of truth of Foucault, you know, one thinks of a, a figure like Richard Hofstadter, you know, the conspiracy. And I mean, the, the, the reality of course, you know, many, I don't think it's particularly controversial to say that you know, many of the, the, as it were, truth claims of American revolutionaries were false mm -hmm. about you know, George III, the British government, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I, I just wonder, you know, of course, there was circulation of, of knowledge, circulation of ideas, people, as well as you know, goods and so on. There, I'm, I'm, you know, people like, a, let's say, um, somebody like a, a Francois Furstenberg talking about you know, Francophone exiles in, in, in the early American Republic and so on. But I, I just wonder how much in this, a way to connect up to sort of our era, um, you know, how much is kind of shared and, and how much are there like very different contexts, for example, in a, um, you know, America with different sort of uh, religious, cultural, political, economic, et cetera, conditions and traditions to say France, you know, they, they, there are obviously linkages, there are shared themes, there are, there are kind of parallels, but I, I wonder, you know, how much, um, we can both provide the sort of diagnoses of what occurred and the solutions, you know, how, how much they could be similar or differentiated between, you know, post-Brexit UK, sort of Trumpist America, uh, you know, the gilets jaunes in France and so on. 
Yes, of course, this is a, the, you know, the big question for Enlightenment scholars now for several decades has been really about this question. Plural Enlightenments, does the, is yeah. it different in Scotland, different exactly. in Prussia, different in the you know, American colonies, Latin America, yeah. or is there some thread that connects them? And I think it's not really an either mm -hmm. kind of question, because obviously the answer is that there are enormous differences the French Revolution plays out so differently from the American Revolution or the Haitian Revolution because the contexts in which they occur are so different. And yet, I do think there's some value in finding mm -hmm. continuities. And I emphasize, obviously, the continuities tonight because I wanted to make a larger argument about the kind of low-level continuities. It doesn't mean the debates were the same or the politics were the same, but at the level of thinking about some of the largest problems, like how do we know what the world is really like, I think there are obvious themes or trends that move across time and space that are worth identifying or else you just end up with an enormous set of localisms. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true for the 18th century, but I also think it's true for the current moment, that I don't think it's an accident that there are kind of resurgent populist movements all over the globe and in really different contexts. So it's not to say that Modi and yeah. Bolsonaro and uh, Trump are all the same. They're obviously not. But there's enough that connects them that I think it sets up a question for us. And I think that question is partly about what's happened to an Enlightenment conception of truth in places that have embraced to a certain extent democracy, whether developing or not, but whether we're talking about India or Brazil yeah. or the United States, these are what we call at least democracies. And why are they threatened at this moment by something that seems to suggest a real critique of the technocratic expert run state? I think it's a question worth asking and I think it has something to do with an ideology of democracy that grows out of this transatlantic age of revolutions. It's now become much more globalized. But that's the kind of um, foundation for modern democracies and on which there's a tremendous amount of pressure right now. So I'm, I'm answering that by cheating, by saying yes and yes. So apologies for sometimes misidentifying uh, some of the speakers. Uh, it's not always easy with masks on, but John Robertson just took off his mask, and um, he, he will be the next one to pose a question. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the lecture. I want to ask you why you think it's a good thing for historians, and yourself as a historian, to instrumentalize and even weaponize enlightenment as you want to do, as you seem to be doing. And I, 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 you, I, I stick with enlightenment rather than democracy mm -hmm. for this purpose. I mean, in general, historians have thought that the enlightenment was a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, literary scholars too, um, but historians particularly since around 2000, they've really, you know, the enlightenment really matters. And historians have made a lot of this. But of course, not everyone does. And the philosophic tradition is much more critical of enlightenment. So historians have put themselves out there mm -hmm. saying this. Now, do you think this is, do you think this is good for scholarship? Mm -hmm. Do you think this is what historians should be doing? Do you think rather that yeah. enlightenment scholarship should be, I mean, we should be encouraging study of uh, enlightenment thinking on difficult subjects like race. And if we weaponize the enlightenment in the way you want to do as a good thing, we're going to be in difficulty when it comes to subjects like race, on which very good work is, I mean, this is a, mm -hmm. an area where really interesting work is being done, and it's not a simple story. But it seems to me that there's a danger that the scholarship is mm -hmm. submerged. And, but the other side of it is, do you think it's, a, do you think it's actually good, a good thing to weaponize enlightenment in the culture wars? So that's a, that's a, thank you for asking that. And of course, your own scholarship has been fundamental to thinking about the enlightenment. In, in recent years. And I, I, would, I would say though that I'm trying very much not to weaponize the Enlightenment if I can sort of try to reframe what I think I'm doing. Um, I'm hoping the Enlightenment is good for thinking with 
But one, I'm not passing a, a value judgment. I'm neither arguing that the Enlightenment has all the answers to truth, nor am I arguing we should throw the baby out with the bathwater and the Enlightenment is you know, just a sort of form of domination and racial supremacy that has no redeeming features. I mean, I reject both a kind of entirely Panglossian and a entirely anti-Enlightenment view as utterly sort of unnuanced. And so my, my understanding of the Enlightenment, I think, is to try to understand its strengths and weaknesses as it operated in the 18th century and for us now. Now, in terms of the weaponization, I really don't want to make the Enlightenment into a fall guy for something or a score political points with it at all. I'm actually trying to, I think, say quite the opposite, that the Enlightenment, we live within the Enlightenment, and it's therefore good to think about it in a historical vein because it helps us see and to denaturalize the present. But the only way you can do that is by being a good Enlightenment historian, which is to say, to treat it as the past and not make it just stand for everything. So I'm, I'm absolutely in favor of the kind of historical scholarship that I think you stand for as well, which is careful, good, archival, um, sensitive scholarship. But I don't think that means we can't think of, use it to think about the present, not weaponize it, but thinking about the present shapes the questions we ask about the past. We wouldn't be asking about race and the environment and these questions about the 18th century if we didn't live in the moment we do. But thinking about the Enlightenment should help us also think about the present. So I'm, I'm interested much more in a kind of um, movement of ideas between these moments but I'm not interested in a kind of scoring any political points out of this or professing any particular ideological commitments either in this moment or for the 18th century. I don't know if that clarifies things at all, but I think that I, that's what I meant to say. Sorry for a long-winded answer, though. We have a question from Jenny Mander, Darren. Thanks very much. I enjoyed that enormously. I wonder if um, another connection that can be made between the Enlightenment and um, our current um, response to questions of truth is that which involves time and uncertainty. Mm. Um, something that um, you know, strikes me as very much um, uh, in keeping with the thinkers of the French Enlightenment, um, Reynal, Diderot, um, Voltaire, is the fact that, as we know today, is that science might be able to understand some aspects of the world in its present formation, but there are problems and there are wicked problems. And I think the Enlightenment was also exploring the wicked problems that you know, we have to keep running and they're changing for us to actually understand the world. Hmm. So you know, the pandemics made that very clear, is that you know, as one's trying to, if you like, get on top of it, the situation has moved on. Mm -hmm. And is that something that, um, I was just thinking your next book about polit political decision making. Mm -hmm. That's really the problem, isn't it, of political decision making, is one is making a decision about a future that we don't have, even with science, full certainty about. And I think that's something that um, is quite sensitively handled in the Enlightenment and an aspect that might also be interesting to bring back into this discussion of truth. Yes, it's a very interesting possibility, and I think you're right. That sounds right to me precisely because Enlightenment conceptions of truth are never about fixing in any sense. And fixing would be able to, if you thought there was a sort of set amount of knowledge in the world and you just had to get it down, you would have a kind of frozen conception of truth. But it seems to me that you're right in suggesting that there's always a thought about the future and about what the future will do to, in a sense, overturn and expand what the present is doing. Uh, that temporality is very much present in the, for instance, the introduction of the Encyclopédie. It's, it's, it's all over the place, that idea that we're, th things will happen in the future that haven't happened yet, and they'll change our conception of things. Um, and that's very different from an earlier conception of a kind of fixed body of knowledge. Um, so yes, I would say that the provisional nature, the revisability of knowledge in the 18th century is a feature of much Enlightenment epistemology. And that's, that too is something that I think connects to our own world, in which we also imagine knowledge as always having some relation to progress, rather than knowledge as something fixed and finished. So I appreciate that suggestion. Yeah, I think now Michael Frodo does have a, <laughs> a question. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you very much for... You want to take this off? 
Um, it was really stimulating. I really enjoyed that. Um, I think your paper, and I, I want to push a little bit of back against what John was saying earlier on, mm -hmm. but also agree with him in terms of you know, the accuracy of scholarship, being precise, archival work, all of those things. Mm -hmm. Surely what you're saying in your, in your paper is that we need to have a, a particular disposition to knowledge. And that disposition is a, one of modesty in relation to knowledge. And that's probably one of the claims about the uh, of the Enlightenment itself, is that knowledge gets frozen at some point. And so when Kant says, have the courage to hold to your own convictions, it's not just being, you know, I'm going to assert my convictions, but it's also have the courage to question oneself, to go back, to reanalyze. And I think one of the things that you're trying to grasp at or trying, trying you know, to um, to touch on in your paper, in your in your talk, was that the Enlightenment actually, in promoting a conception or arguing for truth, also has a particular disposition in relation to it, mm -hmm. that it is profoundly modest in relation to it, and it's part of the problem that we now currently confront with technocratic knowledge. We know what's right. We've got the facts, and therefore we don't need to listen to how people are disaffected or whatever. There's, a, there's an absence of modesty in this, and perhaps we need to think about uh, you know, how we can integrate a, a, a particular conception of modesty in our understanding of truth. Hmm. Yes, I, I mean, the, the Enlightenment conception of truth, to my mind, is simultaneously modest in the ways you're suggesting and grandiose in other ways, right? It's modestly it eliminates many subjects as simply beyond what humans can easily know. And it also suggests that knowledge can be improved in the future. So all of that falls under modesty. But there's also a fair amount of grandiosity in the idea that human knowledge can be sort of harnessed to do lots of things. And that's, again, both a, a positive and a negative thing, depending on how that happens, so that, that knowledge can be harnessed to make our lives better. It can also be harnessed to make our lives worse. I mean, we've seen all of the above. But I do think the modesty part is important because it's the opposite of the kind of certainty position and the undogmatic quality of Enlightenment thought, the willingness to say that some topics simply can't be decisively settled and there isn't a single answer to them is, I think, one of the most appealing aspects of Enlightenment thought for us still. And I say that not, again, not to weaponize it in any particular direction, but to simply have us be self-conscious about the kind of truth that we're invested in professing and um, encouraging in the public sphere. So I definitely think the modesty part is an important piece in the puzzle, yes. I have to apologize now. I think we had two more, two or three more questions, but uh, we really have to move on to uh, the second part of the evening, uh, which is uh, not too bad either. Uh, it is a reception. The Voltaire okay. Foundation uh, is very happy to invite you all to a reception here at the auditorium at the entrance, uh, but not before thanking Professor Rosenfeld for a wonderfully engaging and fascinating lecture. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you.